All right, and hello everybody, and, and welcome uh, to another episode of the podcast. So uh, today is actually a super special episode. Um, so today we have um, like a we're at a we're at a hackathon actually. So we're uh, we're sitting here uh, in Palo Alto, and uh, we have some wonderful friends at the AI Makerspace. So the AI Makerspace is like a a really cool uh, company. They do a lot of things that will help you um, learn how to build uh, with AI. They have a, they have a YouTube channel, and I heard that they're actually going to be starting a podcast soon. So uh, <laughs> soon, uh, well, when they have it, we'll have to let you guys know. Uh, it's not there yet, but it, it's coming. Um, so yeah, I just really appreciate you guys for um, you know agreeing to do this. Um, so uh, do you want to maybe just like tell us a little bit? About, or actually, first. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself, and then and then we'll get into like more of the logistical details of what AI Makerspace is and does. Yeah, yeah. I'm Greg. I'm the co-founder and CEO, aka Doctor Greg on YouTube. Yeah, I'm Chris. Uh, I am the co-founder and CTO, aka the Wiz. <laughs> so the, the LLM, the LLM Wizard. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I, I love it. So, um, do you want to maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about like what AI Makerspace is, what you guys do? Um, you know, what kind of makes you special? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we are really on a mission to create the world's leading community for people that want to build, ship, and share production large language model applications. And this vision and our specific mission to create this community really came about from the 10 years I spent as a university professor watching students and most of them didn't succeed. The ones that did were the ones that really became enamored with something. They kept building. They kept shipping and iterating and working on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. They found communities of others to share that stuff in. They would always get the jobs they want. They would always have amazing stories to tell. They would always be the ones moving to cool cities and working with cool new startups or going and getting a job with Tesla. And really, I went all in on AI and on remote learning in 2020 after a lot of, you know, not working out in the university system and large bureaucracies. And that's proven to be a really great decision as ChatGPT came out just a couple of years later, right as I was in the right space at the right time, met the Wiz, met the rest of our team, actually working at a company remotely, but that was based here locally in Palo Alto. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So um, now, now that you have the, this company and people are building, uh, what types of things have you seen people uh, actually build? Yeah, I think the for the most part, we're still in a some extension of talk to my data. Uh, I think the amount of what the amount of modalities of data that exist on top of the the sheer volume of data that exists, uh, I, I find it unlikely that we'll move past that being a major use case. Uh, quickly. So it's uh, a lot of RAG systems or uh, systems that start as RAG and then extend into to more complex applications. And definitely in the last six months, uh, we've seen a lot more focus and interest in agentic applications. Uh, and as the LLMs that we have access to, quote unquote, like grow more powerful, right? Uh, we're seeing that actually becoming a feasible strategy uh, even in production environments, so uh, it's it's a lot still on the the chat, you know, paradigm. Uh, we're less so uh, seeing people focusing yet on like VLMs or uh, or or extending past the text modality, but you can definitely feel it cr uh, bubbling up or burbling up mm -hmm. uh, more for, and more. For the people not familiar with VLMs, do, yeah. would you mind uh, defining that? Just a vision language model. So okay. it's uh, just a combo of our favorite. Uh, uh, modality which is text and then uh, a video as well yeah yeah i would say the people coming into our cohorts they're like you know agents so hot oh my god i want to build multi-agent systems and and so we actually had to change our curriculum to ramp people into multi-agent systems like within three weeks even though it's a 10-week a program and that's really proven to be a great decision because people just cannot wait to get to i want to build multi-agent systems and and then you're like well but where are these used in practice and in industry? And it's like, well, I don't know, actually. And, and, and not many people do because they're really not used yet 
in industry. And so, you know, people are building really cool things, prototyping really cool things. It's that line from prototyping to production that's so interesting to us and to our community. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because uh, typically you actually don't see a lot of agents in industry yet. It's just like it's so new, right, that I think people are just kind of trying to figure this whole thing out. And um, I think that uh, the kind of the stochastic nature of the agents kind of really uh, makes it so that companies don't like quite trust it yet. Um, but I don't know, like, uh, what do you guys think? Is there any like use cases that you think that like is maybe like low hanging fruit that companies should be doing that they're not yet? Maybe with like agents or rag? Anything? I think it, it, agents are definitely becoming uh, industry standard tools. I think we're a very short distance away from that in terms of how much time until we, we see more viable production ready agent systems, you see companies like Salesforce with agent force finally starting to come out. And I think when we're, when we're talking about like this unreliability of agent systems, we're seeing a lot of tools that are helping to mitigate that better guardrails, better uh, conforming to, to the desired output structure, et cetera. So every time we have the, the beauty of agents is, is also its worst uh, flaw, which is that small errors compound to and, and they balloon out to large errors. Mm. But even a small reduction in that initial er- error can, you know, get get us on track. Let's say, and we're seeing a ton of that uh, that error correction come out. And I think, uh, you know, we also got to put into perspective in, in terms of the time we talk about agents as if they have been out for. Uh, two or three years. Was that they're a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? As a, exactly. A thing that people know about. That's right. But we're still very much in the infancy of LLM powered agents uh, in terms of the the grand s- scheme of things. So, yeah. uh, but lots of yeah, I think error correction guardrails, things like this, are really gonna help them actually exist. Yeah, but taking it even down down a step b- back to RAG, like I think RAG is is just so not well utilized by enterprise in general right now like there's so much low-hanging fruit but honestly like the incentives have to be aligned because these large bureaucracies they really want to know how much useless work people are doing if they really dug in you you really have to face some of these real these are genuine problems that like they know it's going to be a political whole thing and so they're not properly incentivized again to go down these problem rabbit holes and really find the right solution so when we actually work with enterprise clients it ends up being very very simple applications that will build and they actually create a ton of value and and even sometimes it doesn't even require rag right it's just doing search and retrieval better for them in their archaic outdated systems so i mean i think there's just there's so much low-hanging fruit it's just completely absurd as long as you know how to look and what to look for and that's what we try to train our folks in the community. Yeah, I think that resonates with uh, both Mark and I because we both work in big tech at Amazon, Google, and the pace at which we move uh, is a little slow for good reason. We have to deal with the regulations. We scale at like unprecedented levels. But that's one of the fun things about uh, running this meetup and meeting uh, folks in like the startup community because they move fast. They break things. They try like outrageous, outlandish ideas and. Um, you know, what uh, What made me think of uh, the agents conversation we were having is that this was in people's mind ever since ChatGPT first came out, like baby AGI, auto GMT. So the seeds were there, but uh, you guys hit the nail on the head. It's really hard to make it productionized and have it uh, make uh, an output that is consistent, reproducible. So I was listening to this podcast from the CEO of uh, Braintrust. It's another startup that helps companies scale uh, and deploy LMs at scale. And they were having this conversation where they've noticed the same thing. The only way they've integrated some kind of an agentic behavior is to have it be programmatic, have like a software that is doing reproducible, like deterministic things, but with LLM sprinkled throughout the process, as opposed to like an, have an LLM just take control and run with the output like in a recursive loop, which just results in absolute chaos. Um, so on that note, I was curious if there are frameworks that kind of still work with like programmatic uh, uh, methodologies, but like allow LLMs to be interjected at like reasonable steps. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we're we're partial to it, of course, but uh, the framework Wang Graph, 
uh, specifically is very uh, useful when it comes to this idea of very well defined behavior, uh, which is you know kind of just Python <laughs> Python functions plus plus LLMs a little bit doesn't even have to be really. And I think uh, you, you're seeing more of the frameworks move this way. Llama Index as well now through uh, workflows. Uh, where people are realizing that these have to be very hybrid systems and a large part of the hybrid system has to be traditional, well-understood, well-designed software with that, like you said, a smattering of agents. And I think this is why we see things like LLM routers being very effective. Uh, tasks where we it, it's kind of a simple task that has very discrete outputs, that has the ability to fall back on a very... Uh, you know, heuristics based system and uh, the the LLM just kind of helps make the edges be a little bit fuzzier, right? So uh, the, the input can be a little bit more uh, loosely defined, which is valuable. Uh, it gives you a lot of power without kind of overstepping into this uh, LLM controls everything and uh, you know, the output winds up garbage. Yeah, I mean, there are some other frameworks, right? Like like Crew AI and these other ones that are a little, a little like more prototypey, more, uh, proto more like I haven't been a full time software engineer ever in my life friendly, right? So if you're a data scientist or you're coming from another place, it's a little bit easier to get these things going. But yeah, when you go to the production grade stuff that you, you generally see people using, more you're seeing. You have to learn a lot of these basic software engineering concepts, you know, states and, you know, events, yeah. right? You got to learn all these things that, like, as a data scientist using a notebook, you never learn and uh, you never had to. And so there's this real shift uh, towards production scale engineering that I think the flavoring, I think that's right. You know, I think that you're flavoring the, the classic paradigm with it's a little, a little smart. You know, I think that makes a lot of sense because I think that um, with all of these like new AI tools, uh, there's a lot of hype on saying like, oh, look, my AI can build like a, a Tetris or my AI can uh, build like a simple like Flask app. Right. And like the thing is, is like there's already a lot of training data with like a Flask app or like Tetris or something like that. Right. It's like these are small self-contained programs. Right. But that the moment that you go to something like a uh, production uh, or like maybe you have. Uh, I think in like the talk, or you were mentioning like 10,000 lines of code, but there might be like 100,000 lines of code or a million lines of code. Like I think Android is like 400 gigabytes <laughs> or something like that of like actual code, right? So it's like, you know, the LLM it isn't able to process uh, that much. So like, you know, LLMs can do a lot, but there's limits to what they can do, right? And um, like knowing like actually like traditional software engineering um, is really valuable. And like the LLM still kind of get... Uh, stuck in these like local uh, optimas and um, yeah I just like completely agree with you have to say like that uh, you know the LLMs are just like one little tiny piece of like the entire engineering pie yeah it's funny when people are like well I'll choose a long context window LLM, oh yeah right? and then it's like yeah yeah okay well they put your you know 100 million lines of code in there and then press go and see if it fixes the bug you know it's yeah. like, let's try it out and then it's like how much did you just spend on, on producing and shoving those tokens through, you know, and this this idea of like you're just not, yeah, you can like out LLM and out, you know, like you can spend as much money as it takes to get this thing to like work that way. But it's like if you just thought about it for a second, you probably would have just built some software to do it. And that's exactly the the thing. And it, it, when, when we're talking about like this this hyper, you know, not hyper scale problem, but at least like. These very convoluted problems uh, where, you know, that the, the human understanding is the thing that lets you be able to quote unquote fix the bug, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, LLMs just aren't there yet. They can't see that far. They don't attend to tokens that are across those kinds of distances in reasonable time frames. Uh, and the other thing that I'm struck by all the time is if you look at the path of innovation that we're going down for LLM style applications or injecting LLMs into our applications. We're really just relearning lesson after lesson that we already learn in software engineering proper, right? Uh, we're, we're, even when we look at things like inference optimization, we're, we're taking things that we learned when we were creating operating systems, right? For the first time. 
Uh, and I think this is the the reason why we're so excited whenever we have people who are very software engineering focused who attend our, our courses or, or, or uh, consumer content because those people can bring all of those skills. It, we're talking about, it, it, frameworks talk about async as if it's like this value add. But if you look at the rest of the web or app development world, it's just like mandatory. It's a, it's just part of the DNA of that kind of engineering. So it's, we're just reinventing the wheel, but this time we've, We've added all LMs. Now, let me give a quick shout out to everybody out there that doesn't have a software engineering background like me, right? So I've been learning this stuff as we as we go along over the years with with Wiz here. And like like I didn't know what async was until we started, you know, having to teach this stuff. And we started to have having to I had to start having to learn this stuff for real. And and I think like when you when you have to go and you have to get into engineering and you're like like, well, God, how, how do I, how do I do this exactly? You know, and it's like, that's where it's like, well, don't go run out and get a computer engineering degree or something. It's like, it's like, you got to learn it through building stuff. And I think one of the things that I would be, yeah, I'd be super curious if you guys went and interviewed a bunch more people on this is like, so the, the most interesting people that come in to this, to this sort of rediscovering the patterns idea and the layers of abstraction keep increasing. Are the sort of like, you know, men and women that have had really a lot of experience building software, like since the early days of the internet. And they'll say, well, that's just like, you know, when we needed to make that protocol. And that's just like, and I'm like, really? It is like, and, and it makes me interested in the history of how the software came to be how it is even today. Because yeah, there's this real, there's this real, you know, sense of rediscovery and and this this enthusiasm for this this new wave of enthusiasm for this rediscovery phase is just it's so interesting and it's so hard to articulate and get a handle on and so yeah i, I would really encourage you guys and and maybe we can introduce you to some in our community yeah we, we would love to meet them and, and I, I think uh you know it is really true that uh throughout time there's been a lot of hard problems that have been solved i mean the people who like you know, worked like created computers are, are freaking geniuses. Like, I mean, like it, it's amazing, right? And um, like it's also uh, kind of interesting because like back in the day, I mean, they were running on these like really um, kind of like not powerful machines, right? Like, I mean, th the they had to like eke every last little bit of like a memory and compute that they could. And now it's like, we have like, I don't even know, like something like giant. It feels like, you know, we're like driving a hammer with like a, a steamroller or something like that sometimes, you know? Um, I, would, I would add to that though, because I, I totally agree with you, but there's also the interesting parallel that like right now, think about the amount of compute resources that it takes to say power an LLM, like a, like Llama 405B, right? So 405 billion parameter large language model. And think of just physically how much space is needed to compute that and draw that parallel to the early days of compute when we had su super huge computers to do what we now think of as extraordinarily trivial tasks, right? And you can imagine that if we find a way or we, we which of course I think the, the industry is very hopeful for, if we find a way to realize that we're in that stage now right mm. and how this technology will progress forward I, I think it is exactly that we are we need to reinvent the wheel for this specific technology uh, and while i'm i'm very hopeful that we can use a lot of the lessons of, of your uh to, to help do that you know, we, we've got to get very clever about going forward to get us back to where we can have this conversation in another 70 years and talk about how, uh, you know, LLMs, remember when we used to run them on data centers instead of like my, <laughs> my pocket phone or whatever, you know? So, yeah. I, I have like a mixed uh, feelings about that because on the one hand, yes, uh, compute is getting more powerful and all these data centers are becoming more and more massive and NVIDIA is releasing faster and faster chips and we're hosting another meetup at Samba Nova, which has like inference that is unheard of at this point. And I feel like developers are getting a little lazy and just throwing everything into this one large context window. Um, but on the other hand, yes, I think we are just relearning all the same problems that we've learned uh, in the past. And it, 
it reminds me of this algorithms class where we're just like uh, thinking uh, conceptually about reducing problem sets into the the basic representation mm-hmm. of the problem. Um, and ideally, we'd have a combination of both. Yes, we would have the luxury to be able to just throw everything at these LLMs. But on the other hand, the smart people need to be thinking about how to optimize the hell out of this. Yeah. Um, well, and it, developers, even, even at this very hackathon, they, they came up you know, after the workshop and they're, they're asking how to do this or that. And I'm always, I'm always more product minded and I'm bringing them back and I'm saying, well, yeah, okay, sure, you could, okay. But why do you need to run four concurrent LLM calls in the midst of a rat, like, what's the question that you're asking that the user needs a response to that really requires for truly concurrent instead of just decide which one to do next, you know, and, and there's this real, like, elegance and simplicity that's often, you know, just cast aside because, you know, Big Bad GPU is pretty cool. I mean, you know, more GPU is more better. Um, on that note, I had a more practical question for some of our listeners and maybe the people at the hackathon, because uh, we heard a couple demos uh, at workshops where they were explaining how to fine tune a model and deploy your own custom uh, model. But personally, I feel like the most sensible approach is just go to GPT-4, um, give it some, uh, uh, you know, a few shot examples and have it uh, work with your use case. So the question um rag or few shot examples versus fine tuning but what do you think so we i mean you set us up we have a we have a meme about this so the is rag or fine tuning the answer is yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> i think there is a and you're absolutely correct so for a lot of problems there's there's absolutely no need to fine tune at all whatsoever uh using few shot examples many sh- whatever you can pay for right gonna be totally fine at some point we get to this space where we're we're paying a lot for every prompt because every prompt has n examples right and at some point we just want to bake those n examples into the model itself and stop you know if we're paying by token for say a gbt 4.0 or something or we're just thinking about having that uh wasted context window right mm-hmm. uh though with you know KV cache and everything like this is less of a problem. Sure, uh, but the the, the idea is it, there is there is a, an idea of a gradient or spectrum. I think when it comes to fine tuning and rag, though, for almost all use cases, we just say just use rag, right? Like if you're not trying to do this uh, heavy domain adaptation, if you're not trying to do these very specific tasks, like fine tuning is not just you're going to waste your time. And you're going to push your app to production and you're going to get it in the hands of your users a week later than you could have, right? So I hard agree that in almost all cases, we want to, we want to start with RAG, but there, there does exist this space where fine-tuning can be yeah, a, a quet shower, right? Yeah, so, exactly. so, you, so you start with prompt engineering and like generally before you even go to RAG, right? One shot, two shot, few shot, fine. Okay, I'm going to... But then before you even go add knowledge, like if, if you're getting a decent result and you want to, let's say, baseline and benchmark it, you just use more prompting to evaluate what you've done. So that, that's like first step for you to leave prompting. And then you can say like, and you can just prompt the evaluator, right? How good, it'll just tell you good, one out of 10, you know? We do dopeness a lot, how dope was it, right? But, but really, if you look inside the evaluation frameworks, they're just prompted as well, right? And so then you go and you, you might, try some rag, right? And then you're like, well, you're probably going to make some changes, try some chunk size things, change some retrievers. And then probably a next step is often fine-tune the embedding model for rag. You just fine-tune on the data that you're doing rag on. That's sort of a nice next step that will always give you quantitatively nice accuracy and result improvements. And then maybe you're going to go back and you're going to do some more advanced rag. Maybe you add an agent at that point. You got to give it access to some public stuff if that's cool with your enterprise work. And then maybe you fine tune a chat model in the end if you're at this 95, but I need to get to 98% accuracy before deploying. So I think there's a sequence and you start with prompting exactly as you said. Go to RAG, consider fine tuning if it, if it's important for your application, then, and then agents because obviously agents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, why not? Yeah, right, right. and then multi-agents, right? Yeah. yeah. Just because the board is going to love it. <laughs>
so, so I think that we're, we're kind of uh, speaking like a little bit uh, abstract right now um, when it comes to like, so I think that like, you know, it makes sense. You're, uh, you're starting something new. You want to use AI. So, and you want to be able to query your documents or something. So you are going to use rag and then maybe you're going to fine tune for your specific use case. But like, is there any specific use cases that you've seen people use that like maybe they follow this type of workflow or maybe like, okay, like maybe rag isn't what you need. Like maybe like you need to like, fine tune. Is there anything that you've like maybe uh, seen somebody build uh, or like any like hypothetical like use cases that you could think of? Well, there's a funny story that we we taught this class that we didn't teach RAG and it was all about the transformer and how to do training and tuning of the transformer. Right? We said, okay, like, and it was, it was last year. So it was like in the year of RAG, right? So everybody was RAG minded. And, and we we're like, no, 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 you're supposed to do fine tune. And so you can actually force RAG into a fine tuning paradigm by shopping up the data into input output question sets or input output whatever you want sets and it'll it'll flavor the, the that like a rag application would but it's a it's a stupid idea right and so like i, I think the the and it and it's stupid because like rag is just so much simpler to just try real quick and see again it goes back to what is the question that you want answered in this question answer system or what's the input you want what's the output you want like this, this is so hard for especially developers to do because they don't, they don't want to be product managers. But in this age of AI, to decide on the underlying generative AI patterns you should leverage, prompt engineering, rag, fine-tuning agents, to decide on the right ones, you have to understand what the problem is you're solving and why you're solving it and how you're going to leverage those patterns to do so is the implementation problem. And if you just leave the implementation problem separate, the implementation people are going to be like, well, I want to do the coolest implementation thing. I want to do the most fun. Yeah, I want to make the GPU go burr. I don't want to, you know, I don't really care about business value because my salary doesn't change. So I think it goes back again to, to incentives. And that's why I think startups are, you know, where you have the end-to-end unicorn AI engineer people that are product-minded and also DevOps-minded. Like, yeah, like these people are building cool things. So so to, to the specific question, though, you know, specific use cases... Gotta be domain adaptation is the number one, I would say, where for you fine tuning. For fine tuning. Like you if you're going to be in a very specific domain with very domain specific Joggy language, words. Exactly. Right. Doctors, lawyers, this kind of like you know, they use fancy schmancy words and you're like, what is that? Or or you're in a large bureaucracy and they have acronym or initialism soup or whatever it is, right? And and the idea too is like when there's a lot of con- conflicting words right so if you're in a domain that has words that we would understand or use in common parlance that have very specific or very narrow meanings in that domain uh something like fine tuning is very useful as well as in things like sovereign ai so ai systems built for specific countries or specific dialects specific languages uh fine tuning is going to be very useful for those cases as well Uh, so just to sorry to cut you off but uh just to make it kind of more, uh, I guess, uh, tangible. So yeah. Like when you say like specific domains, you'd be like, okay, if I'm a, if I'm a lawyer yeah. and uh, I have like a bunch of legalese mm-hmm. and I have uh, a lot of things that like maybe wouldn't apply in other cases, maybe I would fine tune for my law firm. Or, like, it, or if maybe if I'm a doctor, I'm like uh, researching all these like uh, novel diseases, maybe I would do some fine tuning. Yes. Um, but then maybe like, for the rag case, it's like maybe uh, I'm like a, a regular startup and I'm like just trying to access my company's internal documents, but I'm like, a, I don't know, like a, some the marketer or something, yep. right? And like I have like maybe some of my uh, like customer data, but some of my internal docs for that, maybe rag might be the right solution. I don't need to do fine tuning. Is, would you say that's maybe like a right summary? 100% true. I would add that e- even when we're talking about like law, even more specifically, contract law versus IP law versus like this is the level of granularity that you want to start thinking about fine tuning at. So not just the general domain of law, but specific practices of law as well as specific practices of medicine. Right, that's where fine tuning is really going to uh, catapult you ahead. And for RAG, absolutely. The, the the meme we used to say, right, which is still I think very true, when you want to teach the language new behavior to understand words better, you're going to use fine tuning. But when you just need to add new knowledge, right? When we just need to be up to date, let's say, 
so you're you're working in a, a a news organization. You're a journalist. You want to be able to uh, have the most up to date news from your whatever sources that you have as APIs, that's perfect for RAG because you're going to be able to get information that came out yesterday or five minutes ago, which you would not be able to have from that pre-trained frozen LLM. So uh, basically the way that I would think about it, if you need new information or you need to add knowledge, so like you, exactly what you said about like you have some knowledge base and you need to be able to communicate with it, that's where RAG is going to shine way more than fine tuning ever could. But when you get into that needly language, when you get into those narrow channels of domains, fine tuning is going to be, it's just going to allow you, your system to understand all of those words a lot better, to understand what that the, what they mean in context, right? Uh, and, and of course, you can always combine the two all the time, but that's, that's yeah, what yeah, I just to put a, Just put a really fine point on this to your to your question, right? It's like, you got PDFs, you got docs. What words are in the docs? Are they words that the LLM was trained on? If they are, just use RAG. If they're not, use RAG and fine tuning in that sequence, you know? Okay, I think that's a, a fantastic summary. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, maybe to dive down just on one point, you mentioned uh, maybe like uh, trying to get this LLM to understand uh, the difference between like homonyms, uh, words that maybe sound or look the same, but have differences in uh, depending on context. And you mentioned maybe like fine-tuning the embedding model itself in addition to fine-tuning like the, the LLM. So would that like cause problems if you want to then go back and use the vanilla version of ChatGPT or use other models that are trained on different embeddings? How would that work? So we want to be very careful. And this is, this is the worst because we've, worst. we've used the same word to describe five different systems. So the embedding model in RAG is completely distinct and different from the embeddings of a of a transformer model the tokenizer and exactly so so when you fine tune that embedding model right which is which is a separate entity to the llm they only converse through the idea of tokens and natural language so you're not really going to suffer if you train that embedding model to be more specialized to your data set it's just going to retrieve better context which is then going to be used by the llm but there's it's just translated through natural language, so there's no like penalty or or if you you say you switch your generation model, there's no penalty if you're uh, still using your old fine tuned embedding model since we are translating through natural language. Uh, we 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 don't have to worry about that uh, that gumming up the words. If you train your generator, absolutely, absolutely. Well, this this that was gonna, that's what I was going to say. Is yeah. You have the retriever. And you have the generator, and the retriever has the embedding model. The generator is the chat model, is the chat instruction tune model. And so they're actually completely separate, right? Because you have the retrieval, then you have put the, everything, you just put it in context, you put it in the prompt, and then you feed that prompt to the generator. So you can, you can do it completely independently, and, uh, and it works pretty well. Very small note that we got to say. I got to say, I got to bring it up. Didn't used to be that way. We used to train them as one unit. Uh, when when RAG first came on the uh, scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was it, you would find to both the retriever and the generator the same. Real time. RAG <laughs> is this well the original RAG paper yeah. outlined not exactly the way we think about RAG. That's right. right. Yeah. So it actually was RAG is evolving tuning. Yeah. yeah, and there are there are applications like from from RCAI, their domain adapted language modeling toolkit does the same thing. It does what's called end to end RAG. And it simultaneously trains the retriever and the generator. But what's interesting is that, like, the majority of the updates, I think this is right, are in the retriever. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Because retrieval done well makes better generations. You put yeah. the right reference material in, you get a better output, right? So yeah. separating them is, you know, really same thing. Well, that was uh, really helpful. Um, before we kind of get kicked out and you guys have to go to your next speaking engagements, I kind of wanted to touch on the future. You mentioned uh, VLMs, like vision, uh, and with Meta's new AR vision, uh, no pun intended, they are opening up this developer platform to allow people to like um, try to build overlays on top of your current reality and uh you know there's the vision pro which also does similar things but in a slightly different way 
Where do you see the future of LLM, RAG, uh, agentic behavior in this new vision uh, world? And I think even Andrew Ng was like pushing for vision agents as like the new next well, it's just like humans, right? I mean, we have a lot of senses and we use them to do better work than if we don't have them, right? Like uh, uh, w without vision, uh, we we are impaired, right? And I think we the same is true of the systems we're building now. They're great and they work in their modality like absolute legends and we love that. But they are missing such an information rich part of the world, right? Uh, and when we talk about like the future, we talk about AR, uh, being able to ask, what is this thing that sits before me that's plugged into your computer? It's a microphone, right? Uh, but if, if you don't know that or you don't have the context, being able to look at it and then w without needing to build an extensive prompt that really goes into deep, well, it's, okay, it's black and it has this kind of mesh metal on top. It's got some knobs to say gain and pattern, right? Just be able to show it. Uh, it, it, it. It's a measurable time saver. It's also the way humans communicate, right? If I wanted to show you uh, someone, I wouldn't describe them in detail laboriously to you. I'd just show you a picture, right? I, so it must be the future to incorporate the additional modalities, audio, vision. Uh, it just it it has to be where we go. Uh, to to Greg to Greg's point, is making a lot. It's got to have a body at some point, right? We have to have uh, the ability for these systems to be in the world and to understand that they're in the world and where in the world they are. Um, absolutely the future. And Whether we're going to get there soon, yeah, right. uh, we can talk about and, it. And this sort of brings up sort of the AI maker space thing. You know, and I used to teach in real maker spaces that aren't not AI and they're more about manufacturing, 3D printing, this kind of I believe there will be a convergence of the, the digital and the physical world in the 21st century, just real long term. And I think the vision models are going to, you know, pave the way into being able to do more simulation stuff. The simulation stuff is going to be, you know, able to now we can combine the physics and the, the physics space and the empirical modeling. And now all of a sudden we're, we're really, really cooking with gasoline instead of like these, you know, one off training companies or one off robotics companies. We want to ultimately be a space where people can come build really awesome things that are glass that you can wear on your face and that kind of thing. But yeah, again, it's, it's, it's not something we're investing in right now. It's not something we're spending our time on a whole bunch because right now the way to, and the, the enterprises aren't generating value with this anytime soon either. They can't even get rag or search and retrieval right in the first place. So um, yeah, but, but, but I agree with you. I, I think that um, having uh, like robots in the world is going to be like really the future. Uh, I mean, because the thing is, is like the way I kind of think about like LLMs right now is sort of just like a, a brain floating in a jar. Um, it's just like, it's like, yeah. that's it, right? It's yeah. like, it, it can't really, like it can do about as much as like a really, really smart, like brain just like kind of floating there. Like, I mean, it can like, uh, you can chat with it, like onto a computer screen. It can like, you know, do some response back, but like, the moment you put that brain into a body, now it's like the you can do anything, right? Like we we can do like asteroid mining in space or something like that, right? Let, let, let's send the robots there. Like I, I don't like I don't want to go, uh, but like we can have the robots go, right? Like this, like uh, we could start odd, like having like the robot drive my car. I we can have uh, you know the the robot like clean my house, like uh, that's right. Do the dishes, right? Like all that stuff is like is is super exciting. Um, so. I'm on board. Yeah, well, I mean, if we if we sort of connected back to agents and multi-agents and the grand vision of the whole thing, it's like we want to think that, you know, the idea of an agent is quite old. And the idea of an agent is it's just a subsystem of another system, right? People and companies are agents and economies. Neurons are agents and brains. Like what kind of agents is the brain on that robot going to be programmed with so that it can go mine those things on, you know, planet? X, Y, Z, right? It, it's like, it's really interesting. But again, uh, I think it's time to go all in on software today. Uh, these other things are curious curiosities and, and quite interesting. Um, but if you, if you want to really create business value today, I would, I would stick with text as a modality. Yeah, I can see there being a huge issue, especially with uh, an agent that is embodied in the physical space, uh, given how many issues we have with agents today running with like the errors compounding. Doesn't uh, seem like a problem. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think too, like w w one of the things that's most exciting for me about 
a safe future where we've when we've ironed out some of these kinks when we've uh when we've got to the place where we have guardrails that work consistently and we can have deterministic behavior uh you know as we're always thinking about human modalities we're always thinking about uh, i humans see we should give the robot the ability to see humans feel we should give the ability for the robot to feel right uh but we, there's there's so much more information that humans can't uh, consider or don't consider, right? Uh, we, we don't have the ability to extremely uh, precisely identify temperatures of things around us without touching them. We don't have the ability to see uh, wavelengths of light that extend beyond our, our vision, right? And I think this kind of ability to equip our future agents with modalities sense yeah sense is that's right to 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 move to the next step i I, would be quite interesting especially to see how we can use that data to make a a safer better application or or in this case uh embodied agent right uh it's we just have there's we live in such an information rich universe it will be very interesting to see how we can take advantage of all that information moving beyond even our common senses as modalities. Yeah, a superhuman uh, uh, physical yeah. uh, robot with uh, multiple senses that uh, is somehow also communicating with us through our Neuralink implants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Superpower. <laughs> Being the best leader we've ever wanted. And, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. it's. Uh, but it's, it's like, we're, it, it is a joke right now. It's a joke. But there's also a path yeah. to that, right? I mean, like, it's it's hard. It will be difficult, but there exists the foundations of all of those technologies to build exactly what you're talking about, which is absolutely insane, mm-hmm. right? Like this is the, uh, if you said that five years ago, it would have been like ah, funny sci-fi. But when you say that now, it's like, I mean, with enough work, yeah. we'll yeah. get there. I mean, we're close. I mean, did you guys see the the Tesla announcement? I think, oh, yeah, 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 yeah of right. course. Um, I, I mean, like, well, and part of the story we tell at the opening, I think, is 2019. They were like, yeah, well, I don't know. This GPT-2 thing is too powerful. We shouldn't release it, you know, to the public. Right. Well, so it goes. Yeah. Right. So there was, a, there was a moment in time, but we've all agreed that we're now past that. So what are we going to do? We're going to build, ship, and share things that hopefully make the world a little bit better. That's right. I, I love that. Um, so one thing before we, like, you know, get kicked out of here um, – if somebody is new, uh, let's say they're uh, maybe uh, in like a student or in like a different career and they want to get into software, they want to get into AI, they want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, get started this. It, how would you get started? Like, you know, there's a million one things you can do. Mm-hmm. Like, what would be like the thing that you would recommend uh, that would be like the very first step to kind of get started to you know start getting into the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a very clear and obvious answer to this. And it's like, take what we call the AI engineering challenge. This is, this is the thing that we put out there that's going to force you to build, ship, and share your first application. So don't go learn Python first. Don't go learn machine learning first. It's like just go build your first chatbot using an API key, using GitHub, using actual version control. Like everybody says, yeah, yeah, I know Git. It's like, okay, show me. I don't use Git every day. And there's always this, you got to get over the barriers to this traditional software engineering from day one, and you're not going to get it by going and studying Python on Coursera. So we've got the AI Engineering Bootcamp Challenge. That's our answer. And if you start there, you'll know what to do next. Okay. I think that's good advice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that just building something will, will teach you so much because I think the problem with following a, a tutorial is it's kind of like a, a, a problem that's already been solved, right? But mm. uh, there is no um, kind of like, sometimes like solving like unsolved problems where the money's at, and uh, you want to be able to pick a thing, solve it, and just kind of bang your head against the wall until you get that thing working, right? And sometimes like that might mean that uh, you're able to follow a tutorial, but then sometimes that means you're like. Uh, following like random like blog posts and like mm. a random comments that somebody made on some Stack Overflow post with like uh, the link to Reddit, which linked to some like deprecated blog to, to find your answer. Right? So oh my God, I, I love this. It didn't, you know, but you have to get to that bang your head on the wall point because once you're there and you're smashing your head against the wall, you have to make a decision. You have to say, 
am I going to keep doing this, right? Or should I just leave and go do something else with my life? Because those two things are equally valuable for somebody trying to figure out what the hell they should do next. And that is where I think exactly if you just start doing it, you're going to find out, is this something I want to do with my time on a regular basis? And a lot of people, the answer is no today, and that's fine. But, uh, you know, you'll figure it out much, much quicker than going self-studying. Yeah, effortlessly. for sure. And, and I think that just like uh, to the listeners who are not in software. Uh, so uh, I think there's a lot of software development experience on this table. I, I will tell for at least my experience. I spend probably 80% of my time just banging my head against the wall, trying to understand why something is broken, not compiling, won't work. Um, Cause like the easy stuff you, you can do quickly, right? It, it's like the, the hard stuff that takes all your time. So uh, if you are in software, you will spend the bulk of your time, not following uh, some sort of tutorial being like, uh, you know, a Jupyter notebook or something like you will spend your time like a banging your he- head against the wall and trying to get it to work. Uh, so if that is exciting to you, you know, the, this, yeah. you see career. this in our classes, don't you? Yeah. And, and I mean, one of the things that I want to make sure we're saying a lot. So debugging is basically the whole job in every job that you work in software, because uh, it, it, if if debugging wasn't necessary, the AI would already have our jobs. Right? Right. But getting through that experience is not difficult. It just takes persistence. And if you can persist, You'll get through that, and then you'll look back to how far you were away when you started, right? You'll see how far you've come, and the, the kind of thing where you're like, I can't do that. And then you just do, right? Uh, and, and again, it, it doesn't take, like, uh, uh, you don't have to be super smart. You don't have to be uh, technically gifted. You just have to be willing to put your head down, do the do the actual work, do the hard, boring, tedious part. And then when you get through that, right, uh, it, it, it's rewarding beyond measure. One season, a quarter at most, yeah. real effort, you know, you'll, you'll figure out how to get to the other side. Yeah, I love it. I think that's great advice for our listeners and maybe a good note to end on. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, so before we end, is there any uh, thing that you want to mention that we didn't ask you about? Like anything you want to pitch? Uh Anything. The floor is yours. Well, I mean, if you'd like to accelerate your journey into generative AI, then I would highly recommend, first of all, joining our Discord and other folks that are building, shipping, and sharing every day. There's some real legends, some real inspiration in there that you can get. And then if you if you really are going to benefit from accountability, from working with a cohort of peers, um, you know, go ahead and consider our boot camp. Now, you can't just buy it. You literally must complete the challenge before we'll even consider you in the boot camp. So, you know, go ahead and start with the challenge. Go from there. If you're just looking for uh, keeping up to date, finding information, uh, making sure that you're, you know, you have access to uh, the latest and greatest tools that are that are coming out uh, as as instructed by myself and and Dr. Greg here. Uh, check out our YouTube. We go live every Wednesday. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. Uh, we always, we're talking everything to do in this space from uh, down to the GPU all the way up to multi-agent. And you'll hear stories of transformation from our learners uh, every week. So give me a little inspiration. That, that's again. wonderful. We'll, we'll, we'll try to put all of that in the uh, description. Uh, so yeah, uh, again, Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.